Okay, hello everyone and welcome to a, another episode of LinkedIn Live with me. And today I actually have um, some guests with me. These are another set of co-authors that I have who um, are contributing to the anthology, Shut Them Down, Black Women, Racism, and Corporate America. So today we are continuing the conversation. So last week we had part one, tonight is part two. Questions and answers are gonna to be totally different because we have a different panel of women. If you have not grabbed a copy of the book, if you don't know what I'm talking about, if you don't even know who these fabulous women are, I need you to head on over to shutemdownanthology.com and you need to check out this anthology. If we're talking about a subject that I think a lot of people have looked at it as taboo, that black women are really not supposed to have those conversations about what takes place behind closed doors with us in corporate America. That um, for some of us, it has been a rocky road in our careers. And so this is the way for us to start having those conversations. So A, no black woman feels that she is alone when she is going through whatever it is that she might be going through in corporate America. My goal was for any woman who picks up this book and even men, if you pick it up, that you can find a story that you relate to and that you don't feel like I'm hopeless and I'm helpless and nobody understands what I'm going through. If nothing else, you will see that at least someone else out there in the world has gone what you have gone through. And I think that is very important, especially you know when we're in those situations, but also once we get out of those situations and we're finding ourselves having to cope with the different feelings and emotions and no one is there to validate how we are feeling in that moment. So these conversations are really to help you really understand because some people don't understand that black women go through some stuff um, in the boardrooms, in the cubicles, in their offices. Like it, it has not been an easy journey. Um, so to, we're going to get started. I'm going to let each of these ladies introduce themselves, and then we're going to go right into our set of questions. So who wants to go first? Let's start with Nicole. Good evening, everyone. I'm Nicole Smith. I am CEO and founder of JMS Creative Leadership Solutions, and I am very honored to be one of the 20 women that uh, co-authored this dynamic, triumphant book. <laughs> um, as Dr. Carey said, there's there's many stories in there to tell and um, just to show not only the trauma that we went through, but how we how we overcame that trauma as well. So Dr. Carey, thank you for having me here tonight. You are quite welcome. Vaughn. Good evening, everyone. I am Vaughn Griggs Laws. I am a proud retired U.S. Air Force disabled veteran, owner and lead consultant of Greg Safety Consultants. And I have a nonprofit jewelry store outreach and we support homeless female veterans. I am so honored to take part in this work and surely it was a work. Grateful for the opportunity and I hope, I know that there will be something shared by multiple women that will help you no matter where you are on your journey. God bless you. Thank you. So ADR. Hi, I am ADR. Good evening. I'm, I'm humbled to be a part of this project. I am a corporate recruiter, a blogger, and a podcaster, um, and recently an Amazon seller. So I have a couple of hats here, and I'm excited about this project, and I think it's well overdue. Um, and I want to tell my story along with the other women, uh, these wonderful, brilliant women, because I, too, believe that the other, you know, our peers need to hear this. They need to know that they're not alone. And I believe that we all have a voice and writing provides that that tool. So I'm totally excited to be a part of this project. And thank you for having me. Thank you. And so last but not least, take it away. Thank you so much for having me, Dr. Carey. 
I am very honored to be a part of this project. My name is Nadej Foshed, and I am an arts advocate based in Miami. And my mission is to serve in part and impact so that the next generation can move forward and really lead the way to um, overcoming more obstacles and making this country great. And I do that by um, by working in the education center, I, I, education sector. I came out of law practice for the past ten years, and I'm I'm teaching young children English language arts, and I'm making them. Um, Right, uh, right thinkers for the future. So thank you so much, Dr. Carey, for allowing me to share my story and be a part of this fabulous discussion. You are welcome. So ladies, we're gonna go ahead and jump right in, shall we? All right, so question number one of the evening, how much of what you experienced do you believe was office politics or racism? Mm. Who wants to tackle that one? Who wants to go first? I'll go first. Um, I I would honestly say it's it's probably going to be my in my opinion. I feel like it's probably half and half. You know, I think there are some uh, people in leadership that um, take advantage of the off the office politics, um, and because they have their own biases and, and bias, and they have their own you know judgment, they use the office politics. You know, they they leverage their relationships um, to cover up. Maybe not all of them, but I would have to say, you know, 50 50. And I would have to agree. And it's probably more than, more than that. I think, you know, um, I think they I think they work hand in hand in, in a lot of situations too. That is just me. I think some people use the office politics to fuel the racism or they use the racism to fuel the office politics. Um, and also I think I've just kind of seen how sometimes it becomes this issue of, you know, maybe not office politics, but office jealousy and office mm -hmm. petty, people being petty and knowing how to push certain people's buttons and like knowing that this person doesn't like X, Y, and Z, or doesn't like to be around people of a certain color, but we're gonna put y'all together on a project. Knowing that maybe in corporate America, this is not high school, that might not be the best situation to do that. Uh, it could be detrimental to everyone. So I know in my experience, I have seen where people have, really, it wasn't half and half, it was kind of just a nice flow and mesh of them both. Nicole, you look like you were gonna say something. No, I agree with you saying the 50-50, but what's interesting, because I always like to say I grew up in the corporate world. I started in a very young age, right out of college. And what's interesting is as I was going through, it, it, I was thinking, oh, this is just office politics. But then as I got older and started learning a little more, you look back and go, I think that was racism because you don't know right at that time. You're not, you may not be knowledgeable enough to know what's going on and thinking that it's just the office politics, because isn't that what, what happens in corporate America, office politics. And then you sit back later and it could happen a year later, two years later, and you go, I think that was racism because you start hearing other people's stories and go, I experienced that. And as you get older and more knowledgeable, it, it starts to resonate with you a little differently to where then you can speak up and say, this is not office politics this is racism this is discrimination let me throw this thing too do you think it might also be especially when we're coming straight out of college so like you said you started young i know i started young that maybe we in, in somewhere in our minds we we know about office politics but we're like the racism isn't going to exist because we haven't been in that setting and so we, we're not looking at that's going to be a part of the equation of what we're dealing with. I know when I was growing up, I was taught about office politics. But I wasn't taught about we're going to experience racism in corporate America. Yes, Dr. Carey, that is true. Um, coming out of college and into the workforce, you 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 aren't prepared. You really don't know what's going to happen. You you know you have a, a, a foundation, yes, but it it just like Nicole was saying, it takes experience 
and um, a time to reflect in order to realize what she went through and understand why. That's true. That's true. Now, now I look back and go to different stories or different things I experienced and go, I think that was racism, but it would happen 15 years ago. So it's now as you have learned and self-reflect, you sit back and go, okay. So now you know when you have that situation again, hopefully you are more prepared in how to deal with it and know who to go and how to navigate through it. I totally agree. I totally agree. Bob, what's your take? Yeah, so I would say I'm probably the elder in this group. I started working at 16. College didn't come until many, many years later into midway of my military career. So I started working at 16 in the hospitality. So while we were trained and expected to be hospitable to our guests, because you were trained to serve, right? There were a lot of antics that I can now look back at or 30 years ago, look back at and say that wasn't right but it was what was anticipated and accepted. We were to serve. And many a times, and I worked um, from St. Louis, I worked at one, uh, by the time I was 18, I was working in some of the prominent locations where it was nothing but money. I'm saying the um, golf course, you know, the country club. At 19 years old, I'm working in a country club. We were yet as a race still behind the house. So it was expected. I didn't understand it to be racism. I understood it to be, that's just the way it is. Now, once I got into the military and fast forward working for the federal government, there were a lot of pieces of the puzzle that I could now grab and start placing them to say, that's what that was. Oh, that was the intent. And even as we look at office politics, I, I would say perhaps uh, those that are collegiate students, sometimes what you learned being in a sorority or fraternity, you expected to carry that as a glee club into the corporate world. And it's a whole different dynamic, a totally different environment where you're no longer excited. Oh, every woman's going to get along with me because we're of the same thread. No, not so. So a lot of it has to be learned, I would say, at different stages and in different environments, how to really identify what's politics and what's racial and then where there's blend. And I would also say now working with a state agency where there's nepotism in that agency, that's a whole nother level. Yes. Yes. You are so right. We ain't even got to that part, huh? Nepotism exists. <laughs> All right, ladies. So we're going to move on to question number two. How does a Black woman in leadership deal with the same race discrimination that can and does appear? So I'll, I'll take that one first. Um, so my contribution to the anthology um, is a little different, not to give it away, but it is a, a different spin on it. Um, so based on the, the question, you, you can probably tell what it does deal with. But as I uh, moved or leveled up in my career, the expectations of um, a Black leader was totally different. Um, and then I was a Black female. So being asked right out the gate when I gained a promotion or earned a promotion was, you know, so how are you going to help, you know, your black colleagues? And it, what do you mean how I'm going to help? <laughs> I'm, I, I'm, I'm going to support you as I have been. But the thing that threw me back, Dr. Carey, it was that it was an expectation that I was going to bring all my skin folks with me with me just because they were of the same color, just because they look like me. Forget about their talents, forget about their skill set, just bring them along. And then when they did not earn the promotion or earn whatever position they were looking for with me, they were upset. They were upset and not realizing that I was being fair. I was still supporting them. And how about this? They didn't even realize that I was supporting them in the fact that, you know, hey, there's this training. Hey, there's this opportunity. Hey, let, let me coach you. Hey, come to me if you have any questions that I was there to support them. 
but in turn, they were looking for that handout. And that was what was difficult for me. So it's like when I deal with my white colleagues, you go in kind of, you know, knowing what to expect. You, you, you kind of armor up, I guess. Mm -hmm. But when it's race, it's a whole different feeling. It's a whole different game when you are called names or a sellout because you didn't give them something, not earn it. You didn't give them something. So it, it's a hard, it was hard pill to swallow at times, but I realized I was, I was supportive of my sisters and brothers. I was fair, but I, and I also looked out for them, but you know, when it came time for promotions, I had to look at talent and skill set as well. Right. And so let me ask you this, Nicole, um, when it, first happened when you first as a leader and you first found yourself in this position how was it like did you have to sit down and process it for a second because we just said how sometimes things happen and it takes us a, a while to be like you know what that was so when, when you found yourself in a same race situation mm -hmm. again i think as a black woman going in that's the least of what i'm thinking about i don't i I hope you are not my enemy too. But when you find yourself in that situation, how was it for you the first time, especially as a black woman in leadership? The first time it threw me back, it literally, I was like, what the heck? And I, my first reaction was I wanted to go up to this person and go, excuse me, did you just, did you just call me a sellout? Because yeah, I, I wanted, that was my first reaction. I did not. I realized that as a, as a leader in the organization, I had to be what I call leaderly. <laughs> um, I did have to take a minute though to process. Like you, like you said, I didn't address it that day. I had to come home. I had to fuss about it. I had to vent about it and just really sit there and go, did this really just happen? Did I just get called a, a, a sellout because I didn't give? It's what I call the Obama era when he became, you know, the first black president. What was he going to do for all the black people? It's like, okay, he's the president of the United States, not just the black people. And that was a point I was trying to get across. I had to process it. It was hard because I know my character and I felt like my character was being questioned and being challenged. And I knew I had integrity and I knew my my ethics and I, I knew that I was a good leader and I knew I went to bat for all my employees, no matter their race. And then to have someone of the same race challenge me on that. I had to process it. It was hard. It, it, it rocked my rocked me to the core. It was hard. Now, Vaughn, I know you can relate to Nicole just because I read everybody's story. So, no, you got my full over there. Yeah, so it is quite different, quite different. Oftentimes, we don't value the struggles that the other person has had to endure. So sometimes the subordinates are looking at you being perhaps at sellout, but they don't really understood what had to be applied for you to earn that promotion or that position. I didn't sleep with anyone. I didn't know anyone, but God did it. But what they didn't see was what it took for me to get there. They saw the elevation, but they had no idea of the degradation prior to that, nor did they care to know. They saw face value where I was, and, and I, I solely concur with Nicole. What are you going to do for me? You know, that, that was it. Not what can I do to excel along with you? How can I support you? I know there's some vipers. I'm not going to be one of them, sister girl. What can I do to help you lighten your load? Because as you go up, you know, there's this thing, uh, as my leaders go, so do I. Yeah. But we don't often support each other. And that's why I was so grateful for this work right here, seeing the amount of women, uh, you know, reading the chats, uh, how there was support and there was a support in distance. And that was so great. But often as you elevate in a position of authority, 
it's not just the subordinates, but your peers, your colleagues, you're alone, you're by yourself. And you're trying to model that all through. So absolutely. Now, even as we look at genderism along with racism, I had learned it from my Caucasian colleagues while I was on active duty. But oh my God, when I retired and I went to work for the federal government, I did not expect it from my black brothers. Yeah. I did not. I thought we have already gone through that, got the medal for it. Okay, what's happening? So yeah, I was really put back because again, the environment was different. Some of the antics that were played were very much the same. And so I was astonished. I was devastated. I could not believe that was happening in this environment. So absolutely, absolutely. And, and I would say the strength of all of that is always wanting to be fair and treat people with equality. Sometimes they only know to want because that's all they've ever done is known to want. It's not you personally. If, if your subordinates, and I'll use this as an example, if they milk the system per se, whether that's welfare, whether that's, you know, gimme, 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 uh, you know, they're always tardy to work and you want to know why you write me up? Why you so hard on me? Oh, you just got beef with me because, you know, no, 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 no. If they have not learned that level of responsibility and accountability, they'll look for anything to tarnish your reputation. So it's difficult. Absolutely. But you got to be willing to be fair and use integrity and give them that understanding. This is why it's happening. This is why you're about to fire yourself. <laughs> you know, uh, I'm not doing this to you. I'm wanting to help you. And, and Nicole, you're right. I will help you. We're going to the employee assistant program. I'm walking you down there. And we're going to have not one hour, four hour session, you know, before, you know, and you do all of this, but they've come from a background where they expect the handout. That's very difficult because it's, you're now grooming them to a level of maturity that they haven't seen before. Hmm. This is yeah. true. So you're, you're, you're thinking that they, as Vaughn said, they will come and say, Hey, you know, how can I support you in this? How can I lighten your load? Not realizing that what they're doing, Vaughn, like you said, is um, soon we're going to be walk, walking to human resources because I'm not going to keep dealing with this and not understanding that if I give, give you something that is not earned, who, and, and that comes about, and it, then it floats through the employee, you know, through the, how, do, how that's going to fall on me. Now who's in trouble? Because I gave something away that wasn't earned. And, and so, like you said, that want, 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 now that I see a sister in a leadership position, what can I get out of it? And, 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 and it's really not fair to that leadership. You're really making it difficult for that leadership. I agree. So what about the other ladies? What, have you all experienced this? Have you been in a situation where you where you felt the, someone of your own race? And if so, how did it impact you? And, and did you have to catch your breath in the moment or go, you know, take take a step outside and say, did that really happen? Well, um, coming from my own experience, when I started, you know, back in my early 20s, um, yes, I could say that I had some colleagues that that uh, felt that they didn't need to give 100% or their all. Um, and that was detrimental to the career because your career starts as soon as you walk in the door. Uh, after you get after you land the the interview and you're offered the assignment, you are expected to deliver. So I think from my experience, um, when I when I came in, it, it was a big deal because there wasn't that many people of color working al alongside me. So the few that that were there really needed to to bring it. So I I dealt. I wasn't a supervisor at that time, but at that time I I led by example, which is to be early, always meet my uh, deadlines. 
um, and then meet the expectations or exceed the expectations. And even if you don't have a mentor or a supervisor that's willing to share feedback with you, you know, go out and seek one. Because at the end of the day, what I discovered as, as I was trying to climb the ladder, um, hard work wasn't quite enough to get to certain levels. You had to have somebody speaking for you at the bargaining table. Because sometimes we don't always have a seat at the table right away. So that's another that's so, another so that conversation I know. Nicole's but and I, the Nicole's and the to be sitting at the table to help you get up the ladder. And like you just said, I think all of you just said, like that's when you look, you tap them and say, you know, I'm trying to move up and I see you moved up. Can I shadow you? Like, sister, what can I do? Like, I want to be like you. As I say, I, say, I want to be like you when I grow up. Like I will, I have no problem, and and I think I see a lot of young people who don't do that. That there's this this wall or this barrier of I'm gonna figure it out on my own. When but there's a person in a position that you probably could have a conversation with. So yeah, that, that's a tricky one. ADR. What, what, you you had you didn't have some same race discrimination. I, I've had it happen twice actually. Um one when I was very young in my career, like Nicole and um Vaughn, I started in corporate America in New York City on the World Trade Center. Like I was like 20 years old. I mean, it was it was <laughs> I went in baptized by fire and um I would say that my reaction to it was different at 20 and the way I handled it at 20 um, from the way I handled it, you know, later on in my career, because I feel mm -hmm. like the immature career person is going to throw that discrimination word around, right? Because they don't understand, they don't have a mentor, they don't have a coach, they don't know how to handle the office politics. Um, so I think for me, I threw the word around a lot very early in my career, not really understanding. And it wasn't until I started to grow um, into my career and I realized that, you know, I had a responsibility. So how I handled it was I had to do, you know, the, then I had to play the office politics. I had to have the conversations with leaderships. I had to have the, you know, the the write up versus the the written and and, you know, what does this mean? And, and start to look for, you know, in-house coaches and mentors to get me where I needed to be. But I will say, you know, when I did face those discriminatory relationships with same race, I, I did feel, I, I felt betrayed. I felt like it was going against the sister code. Like here we are together. And, and instead of helping me, you're, you're hurting me. You're, you know, I'm, I'm reaching out my hand doing what I'm supposed to do in the office. And instead of trying to coach me and, and set me up for success, you know, you're, you're going in a different direction. And it was, it was hard. You know, it was, I, I would say I'm, I'm, I'm an emotional person anyway. So there were many times that, you know, I went to the bathroom just filled with tears, trying to figure out what part of this is my ego and what part of this is a, a learning opportunity. And you do look to your peers and, and people in your same race to, 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 to coach you, to help you. Because when you're in the office, that's what the other people do. Like they help each other. They go to lunch and they mentor each other and they, you know, they put each other on projects and they do all of these different things to get them where they need to be career wise. And I'm looking to do the same thing and, and, and grow my circle and my tribe in the office. And it's just not mm -hmm. happening. Right. And I'm like, okay, why not? So it's, it's, it's pretty emotional. It's, it's emotional because you have to kind of dig deep and find out which part of this is real, right? And which part of this is really an, a, a learning opportunity. And you look to someone that looks like you, right? That's been where you've been, that knows more than you to do that. And when that doesn't happen, I mean, it, you, you do feel yeah. slighted. Yeah. I know I, I definitely, did. I got a couple of stories, but we can be here all night. Uh, you know, this is where, where we're going in and we're sliding our credentials across the table for the white man. And it's like, I know what I'm talking about. And then you got to slide your credentials across the table for 
the white woman, because again, even though we're both women, there's still a little bit of competition there or a lot, whichever, but, and, but to have to slide my credentials across the table to someone that looks like me and say, let's do this together. And then I'm questioning your intention. Like, what is your intention? Are you trying to impress them? Right. Because as ADR said, they're looking out for each other as well. So if you're trying to impress them, I don't know how far you're going to get. But to have to say, let's do this together. Don't, don't, let's go in this fight together. And you're going against me. That, that hits you a little bit differently. That does hit you very differently. It does. It does. And, and, you know, and I think all of you all have made great points. Um, and I think it's important, you know, that we did talk about this because it happens. But I see where people don't want to have those conversations that that we would never do that to each other. But we've done. But it's, we've, we've seen it play out. It just becomes one of those things that we don't talk about. It's taboo. And we push it under the rug. and you just, you, you move on, but it's never really, if we don't talk about it, then it's never addressed. That's kind of how I feel, but I've had it happen on almost every job I've worked on and I'm 51. So it happens, it happens. And it, I got to the point where I wouldn't even be shocked anymore. It'd be, Hey girl, like, okay, here we go again. Like, you know, and I, I, you know, I knew what was going to take place, but I also knew, and someone said this last week, I knew when to play chess and not checkers. And so I knew that, okay, you can do this. I'm not doing this with you because my goals and my agenda, they're not the same as yours. So you do you and I'm going to go sit over here in this cubicle or this office and I'm going to do me and... When you sabotage, I will probably be prepared. So, it, but that goes back to what Vaughn said. It comes with age. It comes with going through it a couple of times. And unfortunately, you start putting on your armor and you walk in and be like, okay, so what's up? Is this going to be we play fair or at this point I'm prepared in my career? And again, I think that's what people don't see that behind our smiles, sometimes some of the things that we are dealing from the people who look like us that are in that work setting with us, that, you know, we, we're dealing with a lot. So let's Yeah, go and, and I, I would say uh, one thing that, that helped me where I could, when it came time, and I didn't wait for annual assessments. For me, every day was an opportunity for feedback and assessment. Uh, you know, hey, I appreciate you today. Thank you so much for stepping up. I saw what you did. You know, I, I did that every opportunity, not only by email to the those that needed to see it as well. One thing that I learned to implement was a strategic plan that was meaningful to them. And once I gave them the opportunity to say, this is where I am now, this is where I'd like to be in six months, one year. And then I could evaluate those that wanted to go all in, wanted to learn or wanted to just be defiant and jealous and envy, then I knew the motive. But if I gave them the opportunity to plan that career step, whatever it may be, whenever there was an opportunity of a, a disagreement or a, a lack of performance, all I needed to do was pull that file. And I would say, please reevaluate yourself. Where are you now? Would you like to share anything that may have happened along the way, death in the family, whatever, uh, whatever. L I'm wanting them to see why they are where they are. And there were a few times when they, fell along with their peers. Well, everybody else was saying this and I didn't want to be the odd person out. So I went along to get along with them. And you realize you're not really the culprit. You're, you're, you're more of the person that they're, or, or I won't even say the person sometimes is, is where they really want to be, but there's something else holding them back. And that helped me not to take it personal. So when it came time for that review, and I wouldn't wait, 12 months. No, I need you to see where you are right now, because every time you come back in this door, 
there's an opportunity to start over. And those that were willing to grow out of that, because sometimes they didn't know. They right. didn't know. Uh, it was a learned behavior for them. They absolutely didn't know. But then once they got that opportunity, and then that's where I could now start delegating a little bit more, a little bit more, and then creating those junior leaders within them. So it sounds like you were very nurturing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm a, I'm a people leader too, Vaughn. I'm very nurturing as well. So I'm with you, my sister. But <laughs> you are so you know, I, I'm the one who's got it. It's a, Okay, here's a standard. Here's a regulation. How would you like to write your own appraisal? But also, how would you like to write your own reprimand? Put it in your own words. I love it. I and love that, Yeah. And, and once they own that behavior, they can see right. it for themselves. People will embrace it or not. But those that do, they're willing to take those baby steps. OK, I'm so sorry. They'll be apologetic, not only to you, but to their peers and their colleagues. Like, oh, I, I, you know what? I've been wrong. You know, I'm not getting anywhere with you all. And this two dollar more raise an hour is going to be this or that for me. Uh, uh, y'all got to miss me with all that. I'm going forward, you, you know, and it, it was giving them an opportunity to do it. I love, yes, you're so right. So let's move on to our next question, ladies. What was your biggest challenge once you understood the level or type of discrimination you were experiencing? Okay. Your biggest challenge. So, uh, yeah, so on active duty, the biggest challenge I had was talking about it. Not only praying about it, but talking about it. Who within my chain of command could I really trust with the information? Wow. In a male dominant environment all my life, because I'm born a middle child between two brothers. But I found that though there was again, policies and procedures in place. Who could I talk to about what I was experiencing that truly listened? Yeah. That they were not going to play politics, that they were not going to hold me back, that I was not going to be retaliated because it happens. It absolutely does happen. Um, who I could trust with the information and not that they would only listen, but they were willing to act. So I talked to several people before I got into the right person's ear and they were willing to act and hold those perpetrators accountable. So that was my biggest challenge. Uh, who could I talk to about it rather than it's just that way, you know, and that there's so many different antics and it's okay. Well, you had some men that felt, oh, well, if you're out here, this is the way you want to be. And and I got it on, on both levels. So it, it was very, very broad. But then once it was, I'm not taking this anymore. I know what was said. I know what was done against me. I know why I'm the one that keeps getting flight line watch overnight, <laughs> continuously, why my peers are not, you know, these guys are doing this side and the other. And I was never going to be able to be in their entourage. I didn't play basketball and I wasn't going to go play basketball with the guys anyway. You understand what I'm saying? So right. that's where the yeah. politics came in. So just like uh, Nicole was saying, a lot of their decisions were made while they were doing their things together. I got left behind on the mission because I wasn't in the conversation because you all had that at the gym. Oh, the decision was made in the locker room. Are you kidding me? Yeah. And, and I'll piggyback on that, Vaughn. Not only is it a trust issue as well, but for me, one of the challenges was keeping track of all of the wrongdoings. Like I'm, for me, in order for me to um, be able to tell a story of what I experienced, I would have to track that, you know? And I felt like a lot of my time um, was a lot of my working hours was taken up by, you know, tracking the time and the date of everything that yes. I experienced. And that was not productive to me. 
that was, you know, that was hard to go, to go into work every day, do your work and then have to log something that was inappropriate. Right. You know? Um, and then I found myself with like three, four pages and I'm, I'm, I came to work. Right. So now in addition to finding the right person to share this information with, I'm, I'm spending my time journaling at work. And then the relationship, I don't know who has a relationship with who outside of the office, you know? So, so all of those things just create, you know, an emotional roller coaster in itself, just making sure that you have enough information. Yeah. And, and that level of stress, I, I realize that's why oftentimes we don't say anything. We don't go through that process. And those processes can be two years before there's enough collective data to absolutely say we're going to investigate, there has been wrongdoing. It can be extensive stress. And I think that's oftentimes why people don't deal with it. Oh, just let it go. Oh, I'll just go get another job. Or, you know, it's just going to be that way. Oh, I know they said it. I know they did it. But it, because it is very, very stressful. You're absolutely right, ADR. Well, and, and, and I'll piggyback off of both of them is that, okay, so the biggest challenge is the trust and gaining the rapport, but just going through the emotion of it. So you've journaled, you're told by human resources, human resource director in my previous life, you know, you're going through saying document, you have to document because if this does go to court or, you know, lawyer, you'll see and so forth, you have to document. But now you're, you're all this emotion. So then what does that make us look like? Oh, you're so emotional about this or you're angry. You don't go right. <laughs> you damn right. I'm angry. <laughs> OK, because this keeps happening and it keeps happening and I have to document and I have to journal and I have to relive this every day because I'm journaling and there's so much emotion with that. So, you know, you have to document and try to keep the emotion out of it and keep the facts and dates and when it happened and so forth. But then when you get to the person that you finally have their ear and you're sitting down and speaking with them they're expecting you to be factual and there's so much emotion behind that because you're telling me to bring my whole self to work i can't lock this in the car i can't lock that i am a black female in the car so i'm bringing my i, I gotta bring my whole self to work but then i have colleagues or peers that are making me feel bad or not giving me the opportunities that i deserve because of this, because I'm bringing my whole self to work. So now I got to eliminate all this emotion in my discussions and so forth. And I get labeled as emotional, you know, angry black woman. And then as ADR said, you don't know who's hanging out with who after work after five, because you're not part of that. You're not at the gym with them. You're not, you know, doing those, those activities with them. So that challenge is trust and rapport and then just trying to remove the emotion out of it so you can convey facts. And that's that has been a, a challenge. And that's a big challenge to this day in regards to any of the isms we're dealing with. And I just want to add on to Nicole and, and just covering all the bases here. Yes, we do deal with a lot of stress and, and it is stressful. And this is where your your faith work comes in because without that, you can break under pressure. You can lose faith, you can lose heart. And, and you need that in order to sustain and keep strong. Um, coming from my own experience, um, having faith in God and putting him in his rightful place helped me to learn that um, you know, every experience I have, if, if it's God's will to have that experience, it will be there. Um, yes, I know that there are, there are things that I have to do on my part, but at the end, you know, it is, it's, it's his will. And, you know, if, if you've got to respect, you know, his will. And I think that um, once you have, once you have that strong faith, you learn to be um, not uh, necessarily dependent on others, but interdependent. And you, you put your faith and your trust in God, no matter what you're going through, so that He can carry you through the difficult times 
and also be there through the hard time, uh, through the, the the happy times as well. But I will say this, and so just we're, we're gonna wrap this one up and go to the next one. I know for myself, in the last leg of me being in corporate America, where I think the most traumatic experience happened for me, not as just a black woman, but as a woman, period, and that's sexual harassment. Um, and to almost get raped at work that I was like, Nicole, you asked me to bring my host, bring all of this to work. But some of that is a lot of pain. And I will say this, that I, you know, I I did lean on my faith, but there were times when I said, you know, God, this isn't fair. This, I asked for this. I just come here. I do my job. I am being stalked by a crazy person. This crazy person has locked me in my office. And when I couldn't stop crying and I realized that prayer wasn't going to be the only thing that got me through, I had to go see a therapist. And we don't like to talk about that as a black woman, but the only way I lasted at that job was I had a therapist that I saw once a week, like clockwork. I scheduled the next appointment before I left out because I knew if I didn't, I was going to be in jail. It it wasn't going to be I got fired. I was going to go to jail because it was that bad. But I had kids and you're trying to stay because you're a single parent and you're trying to make it work. And you're also trying not to have a nervous breakdown. And I went to church every Sunday. But let me tell you, there were days I sat in that Catholic church and I said, this is not fair. And I'm mad at you. Now, I know I'm going to figure this out later, but right now, me, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not good. Because emotionally, I'm still having to function in this toxic relationship. Because going back to the last question, women who look like me have blocked me from moving and stopped me in a progression of my goals. And after you've endured that for years and years and years, at some point you have to be honest with yourself and say, I can't keep doing this anymore. And therapy saved my life. That I am here and my and I got to see my kids graduate from high school, two black males. I get to see them move on. Because there were days I didn't want to be here. And so I think we have to be honest in that, that yes, we have our faith and we have religion, but I'm not going to lie and say that I was mad at God for a good year. That year I went through that because I didn't understand. And I did not understand until four years later. Yeah, that, that's I, good. I still, have, I still have moments where I'm mad because there were things I wanted to do, as Vaughn said, when you have your game plan, and I'm staying in my lane, doing what I do, not bothering anybody, and you later find out that the sexual harassment took place because the black women who look like you set you up. Like, yeah. So when we start talking about people getting underhanded and manipulating people, so if you're a college professor, you can manipulate a student to do something for a grade. Absolutely. Yeah. To, to Nadesh's part, um, you know, I believe that, you know, God played a, a huge part in my everyday, especially when I was being challenged at work. I always had to remember who I was actually serving. You know, I know who was cutting my check and I knew why. But when I, you know, took to the bathroom, you know, those, those crying moments in the bathroom, Mm -hmm. I had to have those conversations with him and say, okay, I'm here because I'm serving you. This is, this is where you place me for whatever reason. And that carries me through. Um, But then to, to Dr. Yazid's point, I mean, there's some situations where you are angry and you, and you just don't understand. And that's why they have that t-shirt that says, I go to therapy and church. Right. You got to have both because sometimes you're in, you know, sometimes you're in situations where you you can't see him. You know, he's there, but you can't see him. So you got to do both. But but he's you know, 
corporate America with certain situations within corporate America. I'm sorry. Let me, let me back up. We'll definitely have you questioning what it is he's trying to teach you. But I also yeah. believe this too. So we go, this one, we about to get real. That if I'm being sexually harassed and I have somebody trying to rape me on the job, God didn't have anything to do with that. And the only lesson I learned was that your coworkers will hang you out to dry and some people not gonna have your back at all. As Vaughn said, what's the biggest challenge that you, you know, when you got in that situation, what was your challenge? My challenge was like Vaughn said, it takes, it takes years. I stayed there with the claim files with EEOC. I'm fighting with a university lawyer. I'm fighting with a president that's covering up for a student and nobody is protecting the professor. And when you're in that situation, so it wasn't like I didn't see God. It's not like I didn't see him. I was mad at him. I saw him, but I was mad. And, and, and I think God allows us to be angry. And he understands that because he's your parent. My kids get mad at me all the time, you know? But I, that lesson may not have been for me. That lesson may have been for someone else. Because mm -hmm. like I said, now I know that I had to move and that may have been a way to get me to move, but I still don't like the way that it was done. And that if that, that situation, I could have been harmed. Or if not the emotional roller coaster that I was on, I could have harmed myself. And so again, I think we have to be honest and we have to have those difficult conversations that you have some black women that are struggling in those cubicles. They're struggling mm -hmm. and they gonna need more than prayer. Right. And that's what somebody's gotta say, let's go and see about getting you some counseling. Absolutely. Let's help that. Like, Absolutely. To be here. like that's when we have to step in and we have to start really seeing people, like Nicole said, that person that brings their whole self to work. You got to see her and know when it's not good and know that I can't have that conversation with her right now. I need to send her this way. Or I need to say, baby, you got to go home because we all going to be in jail in a few minutes, like the way this is rolling out. And, and so I just I don't want us to walk away and not have an honest conversation and look at the whole picture. Right. Right. That that's good. That that is oh, this is so good. Y'all, I am loving it, loving it, loving it, loving it. I hope you all are taking away as much as I add. This is awesome. this is so awesome. What's going on? No, I'm like, this is so great. So, you know, you hit on so many things. So, yes, uh Najee, there there is prayer, there's faith, and then there's works. And one thing that I learned years ago was God trusted me with some things that perhaps someone else would not have endured. They are wearing the orange jumpsuit and the black and white striped jumpsuit right now because maybe they didn't have faith or they took matters in their own hands. So I totally see where Dr. Yazid is coming from. When we accept that we're on an assignment, he's trusted, it doesn't take away the pain. It doesn't take away the anger. It doesn't take, but it allows us to mature how we're going to process that. And mm -hmm. I can look at every opportunity that he tested me or allowed me to be tested. Because sometimes it was a test for him. Sometimes it was him allowing me to be tested. Did I pass it? Wow. How did I pass it? Did I leave that organization better than when I got there? Were mm -hmm. there changes in procedures? Were there changes in administration? Were there changes in policies? I had to have made an impact. That's when it allowed me to embrace the challenge. Not that it felt good. I was able to embrace it. And even that was a process because there were some setbacks. Like you said, EEOC, two years, mine was two and a half and went to federal court. There were many setbacks where it looked as though we're going to 
you know, oh no, well this, or there's a line item for that or that, or then it was like, okay, God, wait, did you really want me to pursue? I just need a glimpse that this is what you wanted me to carry out. And I can tell you, I am an ordained minister and have been since 1999. I had colleagues that wear the cloth, both on active duty and since retired, even my own husband. There were questions from them as to why are you taking it that far? So as Dr. Nicole, sometimes you're out there and you're out there by yourself, but you got to know that you know that you know. Yeah, there was prayer, but I had to have the insight and the tools and the wisdom and the strength and the grace to pursue everything that he wanted me to pursue. And as I can say, each time there were changes, didn't feel good, didn't like it. Yeah, cried a many a times, sleepless nights. Not at stomach, going to work on Monday. Oh my God, sick as a dog. Just nauseous going into that stressful atmosphere, not knowing if I was going to break down. And let me say it wasn't until 28 years later that I realized I had been so angry at different times, still going to church, still ministering, Bible study, all of that. But I had learned to suppress. You know why? Because that's what Uncle Sam told me to do. Yeah. You got to keep it moving. You don't have time to feel. If we wanted you to feel, we would have given you feelings. I didn't know that so much had been dealt with for a longevity of time that what I was suppressing was really depression. And there were layers that had to be peeled off. I'm going through life like many women, the women in the cubicle. But you know what? One of the greatest assets for me personally is that I can sense it. I can be sensitive to conversations or even people that are not talking to say, if you want to talk about it, I'll talk with you. Here's my number. Call me. Because mm -hmm. so, see, sometimes even as a minister, I have to go beyond prayer. When I know that there is volatile situations, there's some things that have to be reported to the authorities. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. So, so Dr. Carey, oh. one last thing, one last thing before you move on. This is where I'm hoping everyone that's listening, our leaders, our people leaders, people that have a, a position to make a difference and, and make a change is that the workplace cultural cultures, the workplace cultures, we all need to sit back and do a serious audit of our culture, of the workplace, because there are people that are truly struggling and they're struggling in silence. And we wonder why people or employees can't be as productive as you want them to be because they're struggling with so much. They're struggling Monday through Friday just to try to come to work for whatever reason, for whatever the purpose is. So you need to make a difference and we stop having this culture of silence, okay? There is a way to address all these isms that we deal with. There's a way to address it in a, in a professional manner, but it has to be addressed for us to even think about moving the needle forward. I agree. So last question, how has your experience in corporate America helped you to overcome adversity? Great question. I think we touched on it a little bit, especially with Vaughn. Vaughn, Vaughn gave an excellent response. It's, it's not just faith, but it's, it's faith and works combined. Uh, in my personal experience, faith and works combined taught me to be um, not to settle and be a victim, no matter how long the healing takes. Um, and even if it takes three years, five years, eight years, 20 years, but um, to do the work necessary so that you can triumph over the adversity, no matter how difficult it is. Even if you have to sit in the therapy office, that's okay. You know, do the work that's, that's needed to be done. And if you need to change in yourself or, or, or make an impact in the, in the community or the workplace, do so, so that the next person behind you doesn't, doesn't necessarily have to go through the same thing. Any other other lady? 
I, I think it, it, I've learned so many nuggets over my 20 plus years being the corporate. I, I did leave the corporate world for many different reasons, but just understanding that what we deal with as black women in the corporate world um, is many of the reasons why we're leaving the corporate world to do whatever that next adventure may be. But I think it has taught me, um, my, it has given me my strength, but it has allowed me to say, I give myself permission to and fill in the blank. I've given myself permission to be great. I've given myself permission to know that I know what I'm talking about when I am at the table. I'm giving myself permission to bring my ch own chair to the table. So it's it's it has taught me um, uh, genuineness or more of a deeper genuineness, being authentic. And just my leadership style that I have, knowing that that's the right style for me. But it has taught, has made me stronger. And just, it has taught me how to just deal with people in general, all different kinds of, of people. And I think ADR has said, you know, in your 20s, you address situations a little bit differently. Now at 46, almost 46, you, you go into it a little bit differently. You, you kind of have learned how to play the game a little bit, but play the game to have a win-win solution. And so, you know, it's taught me, I, we could talk all day about what it's taught all of us, but I think those are the main points for me. Good, good to you. And, and, and I, would, I would just say empathy, empathy, because often we expect people to know what they really don't know. Oh, and that's on both sides. That's from the victim of the isms as well as the perpetrators. I found that I had to educate people why it wasn't polite, why it was considered to be wrong or indifferent, or if it was offensive to one, it was offensive to everyone. Sometimes people absolutely don't know. So empathy. For me, um, corporate America definitely like heightened my emotional intelligence from having to deal with so many personalities and, and manage relationships. Um, I've certainly gained strength around just being flexible and just being able to adapt and change at a moment's notice. Um, so when adversity comes my way, I, I, I kind of just go with the flow. Right. Um, and, and just research. I, you mentioned something about not, you know, not knowing what you don't know. I've become quite the, the researcher. You know, when I don't know something, I know how to go find it and go look for it. You know, problem solving is probably like one of my biggest strengths as a result of being in corporate America. There's nothing that I, you know, can't find out or there's no personality that I haven't faced um, compassion and, and just, just being, you know, a very well-rounded person. It's, I've learned more there than I, I would probably say from school because of the different people that I've met along the way and the different projects and the adversity in the office. You know, I was able to, to take that home to different things that I've experienced personally and it worked for me. Time management. I mean, the list goes on and on, but those are, you know, the adversity that I face in my personal life. I always can go back to something that I faced in the office and like take out my toolbox. So I, I feel confident in that I, I actually learned what I, I, I was where I needed to be and I got what I needed to get. 